Are you looking into getting this beautiful elemental armor? Or perhaps expanding your relic collection? Or perhaps really want to get the best mount in the game? Not biased. If so, you're probably aware that there is only one thing standing between you and your loot. A massive Eureka level grind. Or is there? Although it can seem daunting at first, getting through Eureka can be much less painful than what you'd expect, as long as you know what you're doing. The game itself actually doesn't give you too much information, as Eureka is designed in an old-school MMO style that relies on players to gather and share information and help each other out. As someone who's been kind of addicted to this content for many years and leveled six different alts in Eureka prior to making this guide, I realized that there is not enough information out there that focuses on optimizing the Eureka level experience. This guide is going to help you understand how to best make use of the tools Eureka offers and hopefully get you all leveled up and ready for looting in about 13 hours, give or take. It might take you a few more hours to build an actual weapon and of course to watch this guide, but all in all it should be done in less than 20 hours. This guide is best suited for solo adventurers. I've also included sections that offer recommendations for high-level friends that want to help carry their newbie friends. During the filming of this guide, I leveled a new character to make sure I've got all the right footage and double check the information I would be giving. However, some of my early footage got corrupted and I almost gave up the whole thing, having no other Eureka alts left to restart the quest with. But then I boosted and leveled yet another character to redo the footage and in the process test additional leveling strategies. I'm really happy that this happened as I was able to try a wider variety of strats as well as to make the journey with different job roles in parallel. Before we dive in, here's an overview of the guide's chapters, so feel free to jump around as you need. Chapter 1 offers a quick look into Eureka basics, the unlock, how elements and elemental level work, how the weather plays part in the content, and how to use the Eureka Tracker, a community-run website tool that's going to be your best friend in this journey. This chapter is a must for anyone completely new to Eureka. Chapter 2 covers all the core information about how the experience scales, how fates scale, and when it's worth doing them, how to best utilize the challenge log, what are mutations, adaptations, and how to use the bestiary. This is probably the most important chapter, with all the core mechanics explained, which will be expanded upon later when diving deeper into specific instances and situations. Refer back to this chapter if you forget any experience scaling information. Chapters 3-6 to six cover specific instances, while I'll dive deeper into what I would recommend focusing on for specific level ranges and what to avoid. For these sections, you can follow them along as you're leveling if you wish to. The ends of these sections contain small summaries of my recommendations if you're feeling very lazy and just want to get a TLDR, as well as a brief rundown of how a max level friend can best help their newbie buddy. Lastly, Chapter 7 covers the shoutouts to all the communities and people who's helped me gather this data and some of my personal advice on how to tackle the community of Eureka on different data centers from my own experience in E you and NA. And with that, let's get started. Eureka is Stormblood endgame content, so you'll need to be level 70 and have base Stormblood expansion finished. The unlock quest is in Ralga's Reach, which takes you to the actual Eureka NPC in Kugane, off-brand Tancred, at the Pier 1 Aetherite. Eureka has a separate leveling system from the rest of the game that is focused around elemental experience. Elemental experience is tied to a character rather than jobs, so you may change jobs inside Eureka and keep the same elemental level. Just be mindful it's still Stormblood content, so anything that's under level 70 outside Eureka is going to get destroyed inside of it. There are four Eureka instances, Animos, Pagos, Pyros, and Hydatos, and you'll progress through them at an order as you level up and finish quests. All enemies inside of Eureka have an elemental affinity, and so do you. You will be switching your element around with the help of the Magia Wheel, which allows you to go offensive or defensive towards enemies, as you need to. If your element is the same as that of the monster, you're defending against it. To go offensive against the enemy, make sure to pick an element that it's marked with this little sword icon. Here are some macros you may use to keybind these stance changes without considering it much. Alternatively, right-clicking the enemy HP bar and then selecting a stance also works. You have a limited amount of spins, but they slowly recharge and can all be recharged at once if you interact with the magia wheel inside the base again. Eureka is filled with monsters, and killing some of them will spawn specific notorious monsters, or essentially fates. You'll need to kill these in order to gather materials for your relic 
progression, and they also give experience for finishing them. Every fade has a level assigned to it, and in terms of boss HP, fades sink down to everyone who is in the instance that is within its level range or higher. Monsters that spawn a specific fade are always exactly 5 levels higher from the fate. The fates are designed so that people do them together, regardless of how many people work to spawn them, and every fate goes to a 2 hour cooldown from the moment it has spawned. When the fate dies is of no consequence to the cooldown, with one exception in the last zone. This means that waiting for other players to join the fate for several minutes is common and isn't affecting the cooldown timer in any way. Don't be a pre-puller, nobody likes those. This fate scaling formula also ensures you'll be able to do most fates by yourself even if you're playing all alone in an instance. The weather and the time of day in Eorzean time play a significant role in Eureka as well. Some enemies only appear during certain weather conditions and some fates as well. A very handy tool you can use to keep track of all this is Eureka Tracker. This tool is your best friend, a glorified community notepad. It has maps of enemies, lists of what enemies need to be killed for specific fates, to spawn, you can use it to mark cooldown on when fates can respawn, it has quest locations, it also offers a shareable link so that community cooperation is made possible, and you'll often find people asking about the tracker in the shout chat. To simply check the weather, you can open any tracker as the weather conditions are shared across all Eureka instances worldwide, but when you enter a specific instance, if your goal is to do fates, make sure to check if there is an ongoing tracker for that instance, so you don't waste time trying to spawn something that on a long cooldown. You can also see what other players are inside your instance by going to the player search menu. New joiners have 180 minutes in their timer, so this helps you to get an idea of whether the instance is old, new, busy, or even closed. If an instance closes, fates can still be spawned by the way. You can sort of recognize a closed instance by the fact that there were no new joiners for like 30 minutes or more, but this can vary a lot depending on the Eureka activity on your server and your local time of the day. Enemies that are tied to different weathers are sprites. They only spawn during their appropriate weather window. For example, water sprites only spawn during rain weather, or wind sprites only during gales. During fair skies, there are no sprites. Note that sprites exclusively aggro with magic, so if you cast something nearby them, you'll pull them to yourself. Walking around them is otherwise safe. Ashkin enemies are basically undead, demon enemies, and they spawn only during night, between 6pm and 6am Eorzean time. You'll recognize them on the tracker map from this moon symbol, but in the game directly it usually makes sense what an undead enemy is. Mummies, skeletons, boots, anything that looks sort of dead. These enemies all have blood aggro, so they won't attack you unless your HP is low. Walking around them is otherwise safe. Sprites and Ashkin enemies both tend to be a little bit scattered around the map when they spawn, unlike other enemies that are usually hanging around in clusters. Most other enemies in Eureka have sight aggro, so sneaking behind them is almost always an option, but there are also specific enemies with sound aggro, so I'll mention them when they become important. Generally, assume sight aggro and be ready to move behind enemies to avoid them while moving around. Targeting an enemy to see their hitbox marker can help you figure out where they are facing. For starters, you need to understand that elemental experience is not the same as normal job experience, so nothing that helps boosting regular experience will work in Eureka. For example, FC actions or ether ID rings, food, none of that will work. However, you should visit your local market board and buy some potions of harmony or items to craft them, as they give you 10% elemental experience boost in Eureka. Inside Eureka, there are also these elemental fairies that give an hour-long buff in elemental experience and damage and a passive region. There are always three fairies in each instance on random locations. Sometimes it takes some searching to find them, but it's really worth it to seek them out while leveling. In Eureka, the experience will scale in very consistent ways. It depends on your own level in comparison to monsters level. This scaling is the key to understanding how to level quickly and efficiently more than anything else. The key numbers to remember are 6 and 9. The experience gain will be higher as enemy level is higher in comparison with yours, peaking at 6 levels difference. There's a drop off after that, and once there is a 9 levels difference, you don't get any experience anymore. It is also rather a bad idea to be killing enemies of your own level, as they give less than half the experience compared to enemies that are 1 or 2 levels higher. Killing monsters lower than your own level is virtually useless in experience farming terms. This also goes for party members. If you have someone in your party who is 9 or more levels higher than you, you will be getting no experience from regular enemy kills. So if you have a level 20 friend who wants to help you, you first need to get 
get to level 12 to be in the experience gain range. However, then your level 20 friend can help you kill level 18 enemies, so 6 levels higher from you, in order to ensure the best XP gain for you. 6 levels higher monsters hit like a truck though, so to put this into a practical perspective, if you're leveling solo, you'll usually be going for 1 to 2 levels higher, while in a small party, you'll be going for 3 to 4 levels higher enemies from the lowest person in the party. In a full party of people around the same level, you should be able to handle 6 levels higher easily. The tank would need to be in the defensive element, while the rest of the group in the offensive stance to tackle this. So how do you exactly decide what level you should be tackling in any scenario? This is where chaining comes to play a part. The chain will appear on your magia board as you're killing multiple enemies in a row. It maxes at 30 and every 5 chain kills, you'll get a nice little chunk of experience bonus. The higher the chain is, the more experience every kill is worth, and the less time you have to kill the next monster in the chain. This is why you want to focus monsters that are higher in level from you, but also those that don't make you lose the chain along the way because they're too tanky or make you work too hard to stay alive. Note that sprites, ashkin, and mutated or adapted monsters give more experience than regular enemies, so when possible, try to aim those types of enemies for chain 5, 10, 15, etc. This way, you'll bank some juicy experience on those chain bonuses. Once you finish your first quest in Animos, you'll unlock the Eureka portion of the challenge log. It is located under Other section, and it resets weekly every Tuesday at 9am server time. This will significantly help you boost through several levels, and it can be used strategically to help you get through some of the more grindy level ranges in Eureka. Generally, keep in mind the Tuesday reset, and how much time you have to finish the challenge log before the reset happens. If you're starting the grind late in the week, make sure to finish it quickly, to not waste any experience. If you're starting your grind on a Wednesday, you may want to try to delay finishing as many categories as you can until later in the week. The reason for this is that the challenge log experience scales with your own level. While it can be useful at any level, some level ranges are a bit slower to get through than others because enemy options are not as good and this is where you can use the challenge log to help you speed through those more efficiently. I'll of course be giving some advice to where I would use the log in every instance, but you'll adjust this to your own needs depending on your available time. I've mentioned mutations and adaptations a few times, but note that this only becomes available in Pagos and onwards. Some enemies can cast mutation or adaptation abilities during specific weather conditions, and if they do, they pretty much double the experience gain in comparison to their regular counterparts. With the help of the Eurekan community over the years, mainly Eurekan Explorers Discord who started this project, and Eurekan Academy Discord who helped me update this over the years, there exists a bestiary, a monster compendium of all the enemies inside Pagos, Pyros, and Hyratos that mutate or adapt, and the conditions under which this happens. I've included links to this below, so make sure to use them when you need them. The spreadsheet form is a simple matrix. You check your current weather, is it day or night, and then locate an enemy around the level you need that has a chance of this cast. A dear friend from Light Data Center remade this in a tracker form that tracks current weather conditions more automatically, so use whichever you prefer. Note that the website tracker is not updated all the time, so the spreadsheet based Jerry might have more information for some weather windows. Mutations and adaptations don't exist in animals. They are rare in Pagos, much more common in Pyros, and in Hydatos, the mutation rate is 100% as long as you know the right conditions. Also, the enemies that spawn fates will never mutate or adapt. NMs or fates give experience in a calculated way, depending on their level and on your own level. You need to be, at worst, one level lower than the fate level in order to get its full reward. This means, for example, to get the full crystal experience and feather drops you need from Pazuzu, a level 20 fate, you need to be level 19 or higher. This also means that going to a fate while you are too low of a level for it is usually not a good idea, especially in Animos and Hydatos. For example, grinding monsters around your level when you're level 6 will give you about 700 experience per kill. Finishing a level 20 fate will give you about 2.5k experience, the maximum you can get from a fate at your own level, and it will also give you no other drops, no crystals, no lockboxes or else. This means that you're simply wasting time traveling there, as killing 4 enemies to match that experience takes only about a minute, while going to the phase can sometimes be several minutes of travel, sneaking around high level enemies and then also waiting for everyone else to join, in order to then get no reward for it. In Pagos and Pyros, fate XP has been buffed a few times, so there are some exceptions to this, but I'll be talking about my fate joining recommendations within the instance chapters. Generally, it is more beneficial to focus on regular enemy grind until you are at least halfway done with your leveling inside any instance. 
weapons. Lastly, there is a gear item you can get to help yourself do more elemental damage and have higher elemental defense as well. While this does not affect experience directly, it definitely helps the journey, and I highly recommend getting one of these gear items. They are role dependent, so you'll either want Kirin or Sode if you're going to use a physical job in Eureka, or a Vermilion body if you plan to use a caster or a healer. This fellow in Pier 1 sells them, and the materials you need for them are tradable. For Kirin body, you'll need two cryptic seals, while for Vermilion body, you'll need three Damascene cloths. Their price is usually not too high, and you'll surely get this money back with all the Eureka loot later down the line. These items are also best in slot for Eureka because of their elemental bonus, item level, and five materia slots, so you're not wasting gil, especially if you plan to build several weapons or gear sets in Eureka. To sum up this section, these are all the things to keep in mind while grinding in Eureka in general. Focus enemies higher than your level to utilize the experience scaling calculations, make sure to keep the chain going, and if possible, kill sprites, ashkin, or mutations every five chained enemies for higher XP bonuses. Be mindful of challenge log weekly reset, make sure to have Potion of Harmony and Elemental Fairy buff running whenever possible. Once in Pagos, Pyros, or Hydatos, use the Beast Cherry to help you focus mutations and adaptations, and focus on Fates only when your own level is close to Fate level or higher. As a reminder at the start, before you go in, visit the market board and get yourself some potions of harmony, as well as two cryptic seals if you plan to go as a tank or a physical DPS, or Damascian Claws if you plan to go as a healer or caster. Take these items to this fellow in Pier 1 and make sure you have this body equipped every time you're in Eureka. When you enter, do your initial quest with Kryle, which will unlock your first magicite put into your elemental wheel. Put the magicite anywhere into the board and try spinning it around a bit to get a feel of how it works. Interact with the board again to refresh your spins. At this point, if you want to keybind these spins, make two macros to put on your hotbar, slash magia attack and slash magia defense. Use Shoutchat to ask if anyone has seen an elemental yet. If yes, this might be immediately available if it's nearby. If not, remember it for later. Whenever you run into an elemental fairy, take its buff and mark it for a refresh later. Don't bring enemies into the fairy as they can actually kill her. Talking to Kryl further will also unlock the ability to attune to the Aetherite, the Eureka section in the challenge log, and the Eurekan Provisioner NPC. You'll want to immediately buy Eurekan potions from this NPC, at least 100, because they're your passive region potions you can just chug as you grind. Super useful. After you've gotten these potions, my recommendation is to mount and exit the base, going to the far left. Your first focus is to get to level 5 and finish the level 3 and level 5 quests, which give you additional magicides and make you much sturdier. Pass along any level 1 enemies, you don't want to waste time on those. They are all sight aggro, walk behind them, selecting them to see their hitbox if you don't know where they are facing. Go until you find this little lake with a variety of monsters ranging from levels 2 to 4. If you're a DPS, feel free to attack enemies that are 4 levels higher from you, one by one. Anytime you level up, make sure to change enemy target and go higher level again. If you're a tank or a healer, you should be killing monsters 2 levels higher from you at this stage, but you can pull several at once. Keep doing this until you're level 5, then go back to base to finish your 2 available quests. Note, if you have trouble staying alive on any job, turn enemy level down a notch, but always aim to kill monsters that are higher level than yours. Don't forget to be in the offensive stance and keep chugging your recon potions. As for the quests, once you talk to Kryle, the quest location won't show up on the map anymore. You can always check the quest locations in the Eureka Tracker. For the quest level 3, you need to enter this small cabin, which is surrounded by some level 7 side aggro enemies, so carefully sneak past them. If there are any boots in the house, don't worry, they are ashkin, they won't touch you unless your HP is low. For quest level 5, the location is more out in the open, but still requires some sneaking around side enemies. Make sure to interact with the Magia board to equip both new magicides once you're done with these quests. Put them all into the same slot. This works best as it offers most offense, and if you need defense, you can simply swap to full defense with your macro. You will rarely ever need full defense, so this is the most optimal way to build Magia board these days. Anything other than putting the Magicide into the same spot means wasting your time, as you kill enemies slower. From level 5, your next goal is to get to level 13, when the next quest is available. Until then, keep doing the same thing. This time, as a DPS, focus enemies 2 to 3 levels higher, whatever you can handle while keeping the chain going. As a tank or a healer, focus enemies 1 level higher, but pull at least 3 of them at once. Beware that once you hit level 6, you start losing significant amounts of XP if you die and don't get raised by someone. You can also de-level after this stage, so when you die, simply shout and ask someone for a raise. Both Aetherites unlock 
unlock at level 9, so you can go attune to them when you find the time. Also, during the 6 to 13 grind is where you'll start getting closer to finishing some of your challenge logs. Of course, what you do with your challenge log will depend on how close you are to weekly reset. If Tuesday is soon, just hurry with the log and make sure you complete it ASAP. However, if you have some time to spend, my recommendation is to try and delay finishing the challenge log for as long as possible. If you want to pay attention to the challenge log, you can utilize it by delaying and staggering the categories across higher levels of animals. On a side note, if you are in a very busy instance where a lot of fates are popping during your higher levels, you can try delaying some of your challenge log until Pagos. Once you're level 13, you'll want to go back to the base and finish your next quest, which gives you your fourth magicite. The enemies around the quest location are either Sight or Ashkin, so just walk behind them, you won't get aggroed. You'll notice enemies after level 14 hit a bit harder, so you don't want to delay your quest, as this magicite will help you a lot in killing things faster. Don't forget to put the magicite into your board before you go back to grind. This is where you'll want to keep doing the same thing, but also occasionally trying to focus some enemies that spawn fates as well. If there is an ongoing phase train, you can join it at this stage. Remember to not waste time by going to fates that are more than two levels above yours. It will give you very reduced rewards and you benefit more from the grind. Once you're level 17, this is where you will get your final quest and the final magicite. The magia wheel enemies around the quest location are sound aggro, so toggle walk when you're going around them. You may want to keybind this option somewhere if you don't have it already, as Pagos will soon bring more sound aggro enemies to your life. Note that you can go back to Kryl and immediately interact with the Magia board to get the Magicide into your wheel. There will be a continuation to the quest which requires 99 Animos crystals to finish, but you do not need to hurry with this. From level 17 onwards, it is time to finally focus on fates more actively. You'll want to finish your Animos weapon before you move into Pagos, regardless of what your Eureka goals are. You'll need approximately 3 to 400 Animos crystals to finish your level 17 quest and the weapon both, as well as 3 Pazuzu feathers, which are obtainable from Pazuzu fate when you're level 19 or higher. Pazuzu can only spawn during Gale's weather, but he can only be prepared during night, so as you're getting closer to 19, keep in mind the weather and try to hurry the challenge log categories if needed to get to level 19 before the Gale's window opens up. Note that night and Gale's do not need to overlap, Pazuzu himself can spawn during during day as well. It's just that wraiths need to be killed during night in order for it to pop. Wraiths are ashkin, so they simply aren't there during the day. When you have 99 Animos crystals, finish your level 17 quest, and then any remaining crystals you have, you can take to Geralt and exchange them into Protean crystals. You'll need 1300 Protean crystals for the weapon, but exchange rate is pretty good, so that shouldn't be too much more than 300 Animos crystals. If you're farming in a totally dead instance and Pazuzu is nowhere to be seen, you can also farm regular fates and then buy the feathers for the final upgrade at the Birdwasher NPC. If you're aiming to build shiny elemental gear, note that you do not need any gear from animals. Just finish your weapon until it's nice and shiny. To sum up, this is what I would recommend for animals. The entire time, make sure you have Potion of Harmony ticking, as well as Elemental Fairy bonus and your Eureka potions while killing enemies. From levels 1 to 5, focus enemies higher than your level, 3 to 4 higher for DPS, 1 to 2 for tanks and healers, and then finish your quests. From level 6 to 13, focus on killing monsters higher than your level, 2 to 3 for DPS and 1 level higher for tanks and healers, and then finish your quest at level 13. Attune to the Aetherites when you're level 9. Some of your step 1 challenge logs will also finish here, try to delay steps 2 for as long as you can. From level 14 onwards, mix enemy grinding with some challenge log finishes. At level 17, do the part of the quest that gives you your final magicide. At level 17 and after, focus on fates and finish remaining challenge logs if needed to hurry to 19, if there is a Pazuzu window coming up, Gales weather after or during a night cycle. Make sure you have Animos weapon finished before you are journeying into Pagos. Though you can leave Animos at level 17, I suggest going to Pagos at level 20. You can stay in Animos longer if your weapon isn't finished, but if you are 20 and have the weapon done, go to Pagos, as experience is well worth it over there. All in all, depending on your instance activity, if you see Pazuzu or not, and how much of the challenge log you manage to finish, Animos should take you about 3-4 to four hours to finish, both leveling and the weapon. As a final note, if you have a level 20 
20 friend who's helping you out, follow my steps until you get to level 12 without your friend being in the party. After level 12, party up with your friend and have them carry you by killing enemies 6 levels higher from your own. During your journey from 1 to 12, you can have your friend outside the party spawning fates that are around your level range so you can quickly join them as they pop and get a little boost in experience that way, as well as some crystals. If your friend has elemental gear, they'll be able to kill enemies above level 20 as well once it's needed. If not, then after you hit level 17, finish your quest and focus on fates together or monsters that are level 21. That should be doable for any level 20 player. And congrats, you're done with Animos. Now let's move on to Pagos. Welcome to Pagos, or Pagos. I bet you didn't imagine hell being so cold. This is the Eureka instance that has a bit of a history of people disliking it. Instance that broke the Final Fantasy XIV community's spirits back in Stormblood. It holds this chill reputation to this day, despite being heavily adjusted over the years. Multiple experience buffs and etherite nerves now make Pago's journey much more bearable. But the hardest thing about this instance remains intact, the treacherous terrain. I for one really learned to love this instance. Because of its many quirks, Pagos feels more rewarding the more you get to know it. Hopefully some of my Pagos enjoyment brushes off you and helps you enjoy this part of the grind a bit more. This place will be somewhat slower to progress through than Atomos and possibly slowest in comparison to other instances, depending on your luck. From my experience, you can be done with the solo leveling journey here in approximately 5 hours, though you might end up needing an hour or two more to collect all the weapon materials. Note that Pago's relic weapon is needed for later progression of the relic gear and of course the weapon, so if you're aiming to loot those, focus on getting the weapon done before you leave. Pagos brings several new oddities to Eureka. Sleeping dragons, bunny fates, light farming and mutations, which I've already explained in chapter 2. Sleeping dragons conveniently placed in all the tight spots where you wouldn't see or expect them that require you to slowly walk past them unless you want a quick death. So make sure you've got your toggle walks keybind set and ready when traversing Pagos. Bunny fates are the two fates that are almost always active in Pagos. Doing these fates will yield you no experience and you should avoid wasting your time on them while leveling. They give you a little bunny instead and a carrot key item that you can use to play a hot and cold game that leads you to a treasure. Sadly, this treasure hunt in Pagos is not very useful so I highly advise skipping it. Even if you're a completionist, this is a grind you want to keep for much later. Light farming comes into play at level 25 onwards so let's first focus on getting there. Until we have to talk about light farming, you're going to stick to this lower area of the map. Try not leaving it unless you have friends to guide and accompany you elsewhere. From levels 20 to 25, use the same principles as you've used in Animos. Focus monsters that are one or two levels higher from yourself, if you're solo. Enemies in Pagos hit quite hard, so I don't recommend going higher than this even as a DPS. If you have a few people in your party, then go three to four levels higher, and if you have a full party, go six levels higher for maximum experience gain. Don't forget to have Potion of Harmony and, if possible, Elemental Fairy buff active on you at this time. I marked a few known fairy locations for you here if you want to scout. Also, keep chugging those Eureka potions. As an added bonus to this grind, you want to pay attention to bestiary and try to focus enemies that have a chance of mutation or adaptation under your current weather conditions. How often this happens relies heavily on RNG in Pagos, with a better RNG on those monsters with tighter weather windows. If you need more information about this, refer back to chapter 2 of this guide. As for fates and challenge log, when fates pop in the lower area, definitely go and do them. The fate experience in Pagos has been buffed significantly, this is why I don't recommend skipping them. Levels from 20 to 25 have quite bad mutation windows, so I'd advise using the challenge log here to speed through levels a little bit. Getting to level 25 should take you about 90 minutes with pure grind, elemental fairy, plus potion of harmony, buffs active, and two or three fades tossed in between. This may be a bit longer if you have horrible luck with mutation or adaptation RNG, or quicker if that luck is better and more fates are popping nearby. If you have challenge logs to spend here, you'll likely get to level 25 in under an hour. Once you're level 25, go to the base and do your level 21 and 23 quests. Start the quest at level 25 until you unlock a blue quest icon at Geralt. The rest of the quest line in Pagos can wait until you're 35, there is no rush. 
Now, if you don't unlock this blue level 25 quest, it means your Animos weapon is not finished. If you're aiming to build any relic weapons or elemental relic gear in future, I highly advise to go back to Animos quickly and finish your weapon. Few hours in Animos now will save you a lot of pagos later. For this quest, Geralt will give you the Kettle. The Kettle is a system that serves to collect the so-called light from the monsters and fates that you're killing. The reason to unlock this now is because of how much you'll be grinding mutations and adaptations, so you'll save so much time on the light farm grind while doing the normal leveling. You will need 31 light for your weapon, which you will actually fully get by the time you're level 35 if you start this early. Gathering light is tied to the elemental experience gain, so the more experience you're getting, the better chance of light gain is. Fairy buff, potions of harmony, and the level scaling all influence the light grind. Fates also give light in a set amount, some more, some less. Despite some popular and disproven theories, nothing you do with a fate influences the light gain. It's always the same amount for a fate. Brothers and holy cow, I'm looking at you. As you're killing enemies, you'll be getting these procs that say your kettle is suffused with some amount of light. These procs are ranging from feeble and gentle light being the lowest to newborn and exploding star being the highest. These procs are filling up your kettle bar. Once a bar fills, you have one light. The kettle can hold a maximum of nine light, which is when you need to take it up to the forge and turn it into frosted protein crystals. This is where the etherites first really come into play. They are level 23 and 25, the road to them is slightly dangerous, so I wouldn't recommend going up there before you need to go to the forge for the first time. In order to get to the forge, you need the level 23 etherite. This is the way to go, and these red dots are the sleeping dragons, so beware of them and toggle walk when you're passing near them. When you attune, go south until you find this ledge. Carefully jump down at the corner of the ledge and then turn right. There will be another sleeping dragon, toggle walk and slowly get to the forge. From there you can get back to the dragon, walking slowly and jump down bringing you close to the base. Basically visit forge anytime you've collected about 7 to 8 light, keeping in mind the maximum the kettle can hold is 9. If you get really lucky, the light of the exploding or newborn stars fill your kettle up by several numbers so you don't want to overcap. Okay. You're 25 and have your kettle. Now is the time to keep grinding mutations and adaptations when possible, finishing any remaining challenge logs. This is where I recommend starting to actively pop fates even if there isn't an ongoing train. When you can, if a fate window in the lower map area is open, grind enemies one level higher from your level that also spawn a fate. If you've unlocked the etherite and something pops up there, feel free to go there too. If there is an ongoing and busy train, feel free to join it permanently in case you're building a weapon. If you don't care about the weapon or gear, just focus mutations. Whenever your kettle fills up, go to the forge. When you're at level 34 or close to it, look if there is any Luhi farm ongoing during the night time in your instance. You will need to kill Luhi, the boss of this instance, three times if you want to get all the weapon drops. And you can only get Luhi eyes at level 34 or higher. To get to Luhi cave, go to either at level 25. In case you haven't attuned yet, this is the way to go there, with sleeping dragons marked on the way. From Aetherite, go south until you get to this specific ledge. Toggle slow walk before you jump down and walk past the dragon. Once inside, it's safe to go. If there are any soldiers, they are Ashkin, so they won't attack you unless your HP is low. By the time you're 35, you should have more than 30 frosted protein crystals, if you've unlocked the kettle early, and the amount of Pagos crystals and Luhi eyes you will have will depend on your fate luck. If needed, stay in Pagos a bit longer to get the remaining drops. If you're not rushing, you can finish the quest and go to Pyros immediately and just try to keep an eye on your local Discord servers for Luhi and Cassie farms. Those will give you the most loot by a mile. As for the quests, the one on 25 is in the lower area. The level 29 one is here. You need to go to Geothermal and jump on this middle ledge. Quest 35 is surrounded by Morbles, which are sound aggro, and the Griffins, which are true sight, meaning you can't sneak past them with a ninja stealth. Arm yourself with patience and wait for them to turn around in order to get to the quest spot. This is possibly the hardest spot in the entire Eureka. If possible, don't do this when you're alone in the instance, as it is very easy to dive they spot you. If you must, be mounted so that you can run away if they turn. 
So to sum up, this is what I would recommend for Pagos. The entire time, make sure you have Potion of Harmony ticking as well as Elemental Fairy Bonus and your Eureka Potions while killing enemies. From levels 20 to 25, focus enemies one level higher, pull multiple if possible. Try aiming for mutation windows and try to get some challenge logs done here. At level 25, make sure to do the Kettle Quest at Geralt. From level 25 onwards, mix mutation farming of one level higher enemies with fate spawning whenever you're at an appropriate level. Every time you collect 7 to 8 light, go to the forge to avoid overcapping. When you are at level 34 and higher, look for Luhi spawn windows. If you have trouble with instance activity, focus on regular fates and just buy the Luhi eyes from the Birdwatcher NPC. As a final note, if you have a max level friend helping you level, you need to first get to level 27 before you can get experience from being with them in party. When you are 27, they should help you kill 6 levels higher mutations or adaptations for maximum experience gain. Best thing they can do for you until that point is to help popping baits in the lower area and drive you to all of them, while you do the challenge log and mutation grinding. There is an option for the friend to sink their level down to 23 with the help of the southern bunny fate, in which case they can help you go a few levels more quickly. However, these days it's incredibly rare to find this fate not being farmed for loot, so it's not a very reliable method. Besides, the later leveling with a friend would be so quick that it's actually worth getting some fate crystals early on with their help. That is it for Pagos. The worst is now behind you and hopefully it wasn't all that bad. Now let the fun begin. Welcome to the promised land, Eureka Pyros. A place where veterans say the enjoyable part of Eureka journey really begins. Even though you can expect to breeze through the leveling of this and the next instance, Pyros is introducing several new things that keep bringing people back into it. Most of the weird ledges and caves are gone, the map is a lot easier to get through and the loot from the bunny treasure hunt and a few other fates is significantly better than the one in Pagos. Pyros is a money maker later down the line. On that note, two fates you'll see active all the time are the bunny fates. They are super useful in Pyros, but not for leveling, so I recommend them for later. Most notably, Pyros is where you first unlock the Logos action system. This system allows you to equip up to two duty actions, which significantly alter your character's abilities and passive stats. You will be able to, for example, use Raise with a tank job or Provoke with a DPS job. If you're coming to Eureka after you've done Bosia already, you may find the system familiar. Logos actions can be pretty fun and quite complex to get into, so for the purposes of this guide, I'll be keeping the tips about them very short and to the point, with very little variance. If you wish, play around with the system yourself, know that my recommendations are not gospel. To start things off, take a quick trip to the market board before you do anything else. Type in logogram with partial search checkmarked and check out the list that comes up. I recommend buying a proper stack of conceptual and fundamental logograms along with 5 to 10 curatives and 5 to 10 mitigatives for now. If you have guild to spare, you can also buy about 10 to 15 offensives. It's gonna come in handy. For this shopping, server hop a bit if you need to. Prices can vary a lot, but fundamentals and conceptuals shouldn't be costing more than 1k a piece. You'll have many ways to get this money back, trust me. It's worth spending some gil here to get you going. Once you've done your shopping, do the first few quest points in the base, which will unlock the Logos Manipulator for you. Talk to Drake and have him appraise all the logograms you've purchased. When you're done, interact with the Logos Manipulator. At first, you'll be able to craft just one action at a time. On the left side are your ingredients, the ones that Drake has appraised. The astral array is your crafting area, and on the right is the inventory of all the crafted abilities you can equip. Different actions require different recipes, aka combinations of these ingredients to craft them. Eureka Tracker has a very handy list of all the logos actions, crafting recipes and what logograms of praise into what ingredients. Keep this in mind whenever you're playing around with the system or crafting actions for weapons or gear unlock later. Let's get to crafting. What you will do, regardless of your job, is to put three ingredients into the array. Wisdom of the Aetherweaver, Martialist and Platebearer. Hit craft 
left and you'll get Spirit of the Remembered. You'll see it get stored into your inventory. Keep it there and craft one more action, Bloodbath L, by combining Martialist, Martialist and Cure L. If you bought some offensives, you can also use just Bloodbath L directly, but double Martialist and Cure L is cheaper and you may want to keep those pure Bloodbaths for complex crafts later. Step away from the manipulator and go to your Actions and Traits menu. Under the General tab, you'll find the Duty Action 1 and Duty Action 2 commands. Put these on your hotbar for easier use. Now click the Spirit of the Remembered action from your Logos inventory. You'll see it shows as 1 out of 1 in your Duty Action 1 spot. When you see a number like this, it means the action isn't activated yet. Click it to use it. Spirit of the Remembered is a passive stance which will now show on your buff list. This is a very useful passive to have in Pyros, as from now on, enemies in Eureka have some passive abilities to their element type. Most notably, wind enemies have higher evasion and Spirit of the Remembered helps that your attacks don't miss. It is also a neat little safe safety net as it can automatically raise you if you die. Spirit is also special because it's a stance that remains active until you die or change instance, even if you end up using some other Logos action abilities in the meantime. This isn't the case for other types of stances. This is what you'll do now. Pop your second prepared action. Bloodbath L is an ability that you can recast every 60 seconds and it lasts 45 seconds itself. It's an extremely potent self heal and allows you to pull many enemies at once. With Spirit active and Bloodbath ready, double check if you have enough Eurekan potions, potions of harmony active, and ask if anyone has seen an elemental fairy. Go pick it up if it's somewhere nearby. Here are some fairy locations that are common in the lower area if you want to scout. With that, open the bestiary. In Pyros, you'll notice the mutation and adaptation rates are much higher compared to Pagos, and you'll use this to your advantage whenever possible. Your first goal is to get to level 38, and for those levels, focus on monsters one level higher than yourself that can mutate or adapt. The first few levels should be decent on weather windows, having ice traps, gibbons, and cardians as a good option for every level. You can pull many enemies because of Bloodbath and keep your element offensive towards the mutation element. Be mindful to pull smaller while Bloodbath isn't active and stagger enemies in a way that you can keep the chain from breaking. When you are level 38, you should go do your next quest, the only quest to worry about until you're done with Pyros. This will unlock the ability to craft two Logos actions at the same time and will significantly improve your leveling comfort. For this, you'll need to go to a quest location behind this house. This is the best way there, just be mindful of the sight enemies around the location itself. You can technically jump down towards the base here, but be careful not to aggro any griffins when you fall down. When you're able to go to Drake, you'll notice Logos Manipulator now has an Umbral Array along with the Astral Array. Each array is a separate crafting area for Logos actions, so you can now craft two at once. The more complex the craft is, the smaller is the chance of a successful craft. This is where those offensives come in handy, because they allow for easier making of bloodbath. As a DPS or a healer, you'll now put Wisdom of the Plate Bearer in one side and Bloodbath L in the other side. If you didn't buy any offensives, you can still make bloodbath with Martialist, Martialist and Cure. As a tank, instead of Wisdom of the Plate Bearer, you'll craft Wisdom of the Martialist. Wisdom Logos actions are passive stances that give you massive boosts in stats. Plate Bearer is legitimately broken since the stat squish and massively boosts HP and defenses of DPS and healer jobs to the point where Bloodbath could be exchanged for something else, but for the purposes of clarity and safety, I still recommend only this. Martialist is just for tanks, it buffs their DPS output, so you'll be killing things much faster and have an easier time keeping the chain going. As a healer or DPS, you can use Aether Weaver or Skirmisher for that DPS effect up to you. While I was testing this, it felt significantly more unsafe and not that much better than Plate Bearer, so I wouldn't recommend it myself. Wisdom stances, unlike Spirit of the Remembered, get removed if you swap an active action set, so you can't use them and then swap to something else like we did with Spirit. Goes without saying, if you died at any point, craft a Spirit of the Remembered, pop that first. 
then equip your Wisdom plus Bloodbath set and click Wisdom so you have it activated. Next, your goal is to get to level 41. Focus mutations again, this time you can go plus 2 or even plus 3 levels higher. Both is comfy to survive, just be mindful to have the chain going. Void Skippers, Mechaligardias, Chalones and Val Mammoths are usually the best leveling options from 38 to 41, but if you have better weather windows, feel free to take a different pick. At level 41, you'll want to go back to base and craft yourself Reflect L. Put Wisdom of the Ordained, Protect and Shell into the same tray. When it's placed in your inventory, craft another one. If you don't have Shell or Ordained, you'll need to purchase some Mitigatives and Curatives. This is why I recommended buying these at the start. Once your Reflects are crafted, time to travel to Aetherite level 41. This may seem far and daunting, but it's a relatively easy trip. The tunnel from the South Bunny Fate to the level 39 Aetherite is fully safe. If you see any enemies, they are Ashkin and they won't aggro you. Clippers are sound, so toggle walk and be slow when you walk next to them. Moving across this arena is also safe. It's either fully empty or has some Ashkin enemies which ignore you. There's a sleeping dragon here, but you can safely walk on the opposite wall from it. The only tricky bit comes into play here with a bunch of sight mobs, so sneak around them. The white flames are magic aggro so they will ignore you unless you cast something and if you need to de-aggro anything just run to the etherite stick to the wall there is enough free space here to lose aggro attune to the etherite and hug it tight time for some fun remove all of your equipment or put something on that's lower level than 70 the lower the better pick an element that isn't water equip reflect l and then use it while standing close to the etherite this is important now while reflect buff is active, run into the white flames and keep using reflect every 5-6 to six seconds to pull them towards you and to not have the buff fall. There are enough white flames that you can keep a consistent chain if you stagger them out a bit. Just make sure your reflect never falls. If you see any sprites, they are also safe to pull. If you see any snakes, they will ignore you as they are Ashkin. Don't be afraid. This is a strategy that you can do until your two reflect trays get spent. It should last you until about level 45 or 46. After this, the experience gain becomes too slow unless you run into a mutation window for these white flames under umbral wind weather. The key to not dying is to remember to diagro next to the etherite. That's a pretty safe area. Always make sure your reflect is active before you run into enemies, because if you're using the first reflect while around it, you'll die. I have a detailed reflect guide already on the channel, so if you have any misunderstandings about the system, I advise you to check it out. This whole grinding method should take you about 10 to 15 minutes to get you from level 41 to level 46, even without any challenge logs and even if you die and have to release once or twice. Okay, when you hit level 46, time to go back to base, craft another wisdom plus bloodbath combo and get back to mutation grinding. Do this until you hit level 50. As usual, this is also the point where it's beneficial to join any fates that pop nearby for a nice little XP chunk and for some crystals. <laughs> haven't been recommending fate grinding till now as it is much slower to get to 50 this way. Once you're level 50, you'll see that Pyros often has people spawning Penny, the boss you need for the weapon, Lame Bricks, Skull and Ying Yang, which all give massive amounts of crystals. Lame Bricks, Skull and Ying Yang are popular because of their rare item drops, which sell for millions of gil everywhere. Combination of their three items make a sixth magicide, which Eureka veterans all want. So joining the Pyros instance when blizzard window is coming up will more than likely get you some juicy fate farms. When you're 50 you can finish your remaining quests. First two are quite easy to find and then the level 50 quest is split between two tricky locations. I'd say these are easier than the Pagos one but I managed to somehow die on both of them while doing the guide. <laughs> so thread with care. For the upper one many enemies have sound aggro on the way and you can avoid them while walking. Hawks, wood golems and sleeping dragons. Others are sight but there aren't too many around. The second part is at the bottom of the map where most enemies are sight aggro. This location is very close to where people usually farm for skull, so if you're not good at sneaking around, usually people are there farming a few minutes before the blizzard weather starts. If you do safely come here, and remember you can just leave instance and rejoin to get yourself into base if your return is on cooldown. To sum up, this is what I would recommend for Pyros. 
craft a new spirit of the remembered as your passive ability every time before you equip something else. Craft Bloodbath and equip it. From 35 to 38, focus mutations and adaptations one level higher from you. Multiple as Bloodbath will keep you alive and be careful those few seconds that Bloodbath isn't up. Stagger enemy pulls to keep the chain going. At level 38, do the quest until you unlock dual Logos Manipulator crafting. Craft Plate Bearer plus Bloodbath if DPS or Healer or Martialist and Bloodbath if Tank. From 38 to 41, focus enemies two levels higher than you that have a chance of mutation. At 41, craft Reflect L twice and go to the level 41 Etherine. From level 41 to 46, do the Reflect Farming. From 46 to 50, craft the Wisdom same as before plus Bloodbath and focus enemies one, two or three levels higher that mutate or adapt, whatever allows you to keep the chain. At 50, do the remaining quests. All of this should take you about two and a half hours to complete, and that's without any fades and with no challenge logs either. If you have a challenge log spared, I recommend using it in the 46 to 50 stage. If you have time in the week left to do Hydatos, the next instance, try keeping the sprite challenge log for that. In Pyros, Light Farm unlocks at 50, but it's fully optional at this stage, and quite useless unless you plan to do tons of Eureka. The gear can be purchased for 30 crystals apiece if you have your Pagos weapon finished and haven't covered any 50 Logos actions. For this, use the tracker website to nail down the cheapest recipes. If you want to collect any Logograms for yourself, here's a handy sheet of where they drop. Most of them can be found by doing bunny fades, which are very handy for guild making anyway. Both bunny fades have the same loot pool, and almost nobody ever does the north one because of the tricky bunny locations. So just stick to south. For a friendly carry recommendation, it's mostly the same as usual. The newbie friend needs to get to level 42 to be able to get experience from their max level friend. I'd recommend following the solo tips to get to 41, then do reflect farming until 43. When 43, join the same party and focus mutated enemies 6 levels higher from the low level friend. If high level friend has no elemental gear, 51 plus level enemies will be hard to manage, so you can do fates here instead or just grind whatever highest level you can manage. As a side note, in a small party, you could do reflect farming with the moths that spawn penny. One person needs to tank them in proper gear, while other people can stand in its conal AoEs naked to reflect damage. This is very situational, but works for small parties from level 47 plus. That is it for Pyros leveling. Time for the final stretch, and it should be a breezy one at that. Welcome to Hydatos, the final 10 levels of Eureka level grind. We have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that Hydatos is the only instance that has never received any fate or experience buffs other than the echo buff itself and it doesn't even have the ability to buy the final boss drops from the bird watcher npc unlike the other instances in that sense hydatos can feel quite grindy when it comes to weapon and gear however the good news is that hydatos is blessed with 100 percent mutation rate and that it has a fate that pops on quite regular windows hydatos also hosts baldesian arsenal an end game eureka raid that is very popular to this day which is keeping the instance alive and some fates popping often. It also, like Pyros, has three fates with rare drops for an additional seventh magicite. Molek, Goldemar and Sita that people come to prep really often and that might be a good crystal grind after your level 60. But first, let's get to level 60. You won't need to do any quests here until the very end and I recommend doing them at the end, all at once, so you don't lose track of where you are. These quests are needed if you're planning to do Balesian Arsenal. Before you start leveling, craft another Spirit of the Remembered, use it, then your classic Wisdom plus Bloodbath combo, Blade Bearer for DPS and Healer, Martialist for Tank. Ask for a Fairy, double check that you have enough Eurekan Potions, and locate the current mutation or adaptation windows in the Bestiary. You can do plus 2 level mutations comfortably all throughout Hydatos with this setup, but if you run into a bad mutation window, go for plus 1. All the enemies will mutate after they hit about 50-70% to 70 HP, as 
long as you know the right window. So be mindful not to stun the mutation before it happens and make sure to keep the chain going. These mutation chains will yield insane experience numbers. For example, level 51 corals will start by giving you 600k experience per kill with no chain, coming to 2.5 million XP on chain 30. You'll need about 1.5 chains for each level and it takes about 10 to 15 minutes per level depending on how high your DPS is. You can simply do this until you get level 60 and it will take you about 2.5 hours without any challenge logs and with 1 to 2 fates tossed in between, if any fates pop that are within one level from yours. It is not useful going to fates if they are 2 or more levels higher from you. Mutations will give you far better experience for the time allotted and those fates will give you no drops. There is only one enemy I've come across that is highly annoying to farm solo and those are the Shugen Tengu mutations. Unless you have an AoE that allows you to look away while DPSing them down, these gaze attacks will give you annoying terror that prevents you from keeping the chain going consistently. There are places where you can reflect farm in Hydatos. One is with these mammoths that are level 58, so they are best done at level 52. However, these mammoths are only safe to reflect during daytime from 6am to 6pm EOR in time. During night, they mutate and do physical damage. Also, they aggro by sight and their conals are not safe to stand in. This method is rather slow, unless you catch it when you're level 52 for that max experience gain. The second place is the so-called Sprite Island. This place is good. It's built to quickly get you from 59 to 60 if you the level, for example. But it's useful at 58 as well. I personally find this quite slow unless you have some sprite challenge log left because sprites respawn every 4 to 5 minutes, they don't mutate and they don't allow you to keep the chain going. However, it's a good lazy method if you hate regular farming. Just be mindful to apply reflect first from a safe distance and don't ever touch the sprites as some of them can reflect physical damage back from stuff like shock spikes and thunder sprites. When you are 60, go do the quests. Locations are generally easy to find from the tracker map. Just just know that the first one is high on this rock that you can climb. When the game has you visit the BA library, you'll need to interact with everything there in order to trigger the remaining quest later. When you're done, you can go to the scholar NPC to unlock BA, which will give you these spooky terms of service. So other than the 10 regular fates you'll see on the tracker, there are two special fates that Hydatos offers. First is Ovni, which you'll recognize whenever you get this notice about the umbral turbulence in the instance. Note that despite looking like it, umbral weather doesn't actually remove the regular weather effects on mutations. Ovni spawns when there are at least 8 or more players in the instance who are level 60 and who have finished questline. Instance also cannot be closed. If it's closed, Ovni won't spawn. If the instance is fully new, first Ovni will spawn 20 minutes later and then every consecutive Ovni spawns exactly 30 minutes after the previous one died. Each Ovni kill gives 10 crystals, same as the final area boss, Provenance Watcher. Ovni Fate serves to open entryways to BA, which are these little portals that you should never touch unless you know there is a free space in an ongoing run. If there is a BA run going on, Ovni won't be spawning. However, the BA group will spawn the Support Fate down here, which gives 30 crystals to make up for Ovni missing. This is why joining Hydatos while there is a run happening, even if you're not in the run, is useful. For BA specifically, I'll be giving advice how to join it in the next chapter. To get the shiny gear, you'll need Pyro's gear pieces and some crystals from Pyrazo's Fates. The shop becomes available after you've done with quests and unlocking the remaining 6 logo sections. If you're missing obscures, know that they drop from BA and also consistently from Provenance Watcher Farm. You should know that the plus 1 version of the gear is the finished shiny version. The plus 2 is only adding elemental stats, which you can only get if you do BA. If you build the full elemental plus 2 gear set and a weapon, you'll essentially add about 5 levels worth of stats to your character. This is of course optional, but if you want to build many Eureka relics and gear sets or run BA a lot, I highly recommend getting into BA and building a first elemental set. To sum up the leveling, this is what I would recommend. Craft Spirit of the Remembered, use it. Craft Wisdom plus Bloodbath and use the Wisdom. Make sure your buffs are active and you have enough Eureka potions. Focus Mutations, 1, 2 or 3 levels higher, whatever you can manage while keeping the chain going. Hydatos has 100% mutation rate, so absolutely take advantage of this. If you have any sprite challenge log left, craft Reflect L and do sprite island farming on 58 and 59. If not, keep doing mutations as 
as you were. When you hit 60, do your quests and keep an eye for any BA runs to leech on OVNI and support crystals, as well as Seto or Provenance Watcher farms. They usually pop around BA times as well. High level friends can really shine in Hydatos. The lower level friend only needs to reach level 52 and then you can simply party up and focus 6 levels higher mutations. Usually you go for Mammoths during night or Dreadnoughts during day at 58, then Shugen Tengus at 59, or Pokurs at 60, Squibs or Moles at 61, these Mylodons whose name I can't pronounce at 62, and Zeus at 63. When your friend is 58, you can do the regular Moistbox farm enemy grind on Gargoyles or Pistas if you're high level friend is elementally geared or have the low level player do the sprite island. While they are doing the sprite island, high level friend will slowly be pulling Malodons close to the island to help keeping the chain going. The idea is to kill 5 to 10 Malodons in those 5 minutes that you're waiting for sprites to respawn so that the sprites fall into the high chain range between 20 to 30. This is it for Hadatos and Eureka in general. All this leveling should have taken you about 13 hours, maybe a bit more if you didn't have any challenge logs to spend or if you decided to join some fate trains. As we've been skipping fate grinds, now you'll likely have to go back a bit and farm some remaining crystals to finish the gear or weapons you've wanted. As a level 60, now this will be much much easier and faster to do. Altogether, it shouldn't be more than 20 hours for the entire leveling process, plus getting the weapon or gear set done, plus the time that you've spent watching this guide. Before I officially end the guide, I'd love to give some community tips and shoutouts in the last chapter. The Eureka community is rather small but strong and every data center has something that people have gotten used to over the years. You'll quickly catch on to these habits that sort of generationally continue. So if you end up disliking how Eureka is on your data center, try visiting another one for a bit of a different energy. The most notable differences I found were about the big boss fades I've mentioned. Skull and Ying Yang in Pyros, Sito and Goldemar in Hydatos, as well as Cassie and Crab in Pagos, they're all very popular because of their rare and expensive loot drops. On some data centers, for example the EU ones, the Eureka discords have pings that people can use when they start prepping these fades, and usually a pop itself is also reported. It is common to give 3 to 5 minutes waiting time for people to join these and the other fates. On NA data centers, there are some massive differences in how these fates are handled. While on Crystal, people tend to wait for however long it's needed for everyone to arrive, on Aether, these fates are instantly pulled as they spawn. If you plan to farm these on Aether, you'd better be ready on the fate location when you notice it being prepped. As for Baldesian Arsenal, on almost all data centers, this is organized via Discord servers specialized in Eureka or VA. In the description, you'll find the list of different Discords you can join on your data center. Feel free to let me know in the comments if I missed some. Some Discords do signups few days in advance, some do impromptu runs by sending a notification 30 minutes ahead of time, some schedule runs weeks in advance, and some just have a queue system with the help of a bot who then organizes a run when enough people apply. All runs end up having a host who takes you through with callouts and most of the mechanics are self-explanatory this way. The only boss I recommend looking up guides for is Ozma, the final boss. I have a guide on my own but it's light data center oriented. There are some generally good ones out there so take a look at what your server recommends. Either way, don't be scared. This content is a lot of fun and very special for your Final Fantasy XIV. Go get the shiny orb. Lastly, I'd like to give some shoutouts. Big shout out to Eureka Explorers who have started the base theory and the whole research idea about Eureka in the first place. Amazing server and though I've not interacted that much, it's been my go-to place to double check information when I didn't know it from my own sources. Link is in the description. Big shout out to Eureka Academy on Light Data Center, my old server that is now all grown up with its new admins. I've met so many amazing people who helped me gather all kinds of data over the years and many of the leveling information and ideas came from big community events so if I say to say if it wasn't for my friends during Eureka Academy days I wouldn't uncover this much information by myself. The discord link is also in the description. They have an amazing info library even if you're not on EU yourself you'll find knowledgeable people there. Special shout out to Noranda La Luna who created the Eureka Tracker website and who keeps it going for all these years. If you find the tool useful consider giving them a coffee through the 
the link at the Tracker website. Their work has carried Eureka community for generations at this point. Big shout out to my friends who jumped in occasionally during the filming of this guide to record some party sections and to the random players who partied up with me in Eureka and even helped gather some data during the filming of the guide. Eureka is community-driven content, first and foremost. Look at it as a place to communicate and cooperate with people, and it'll make the whole experience that much more enjoyable. I've technically retired from Eureka a year ago at this point, but as you can see, I keep dipping my toes back into it because of how enjoyable it can be. Even if you end up hating it, I hope this guide provided some security and helped you speed things up. Feel free to drop additional tips into the comments, as I most certainly didn't cover all the options, all the jobs, all the data center experiences. Also, if you end up using this guide, I'd love to hear back and see how well it served you. Thank you so much and may the elemental experience guide you.